Yes, hot potatoes, the functionality that we geeks like to debate in groups and on podcasts. But for real-world smartphone users, how much difference do the 2018 hottest tech specs matter? Which of them could be argued either way and which of them are must-haves? To try to answer this, I've whittled down the most controversial bullet points down to a dozen, 12 aspects of modern smartphones that get every geek hot under the collar in one way or another. And yes, the fact that I've still got 12 identifies me as a sad geek. By the way, I've omitted all mention of phone cameras. A, I talk about these far too much already, and B, I could do an entire show on phone imaging, so let's leave that for another day. I'll build up from least controversial to most, just to keep up the tension. Number 12, USB Type-C hookups. Now this is for Android and other non-Apple phones, obviously, and it's controversial because the larger, more robust, reversible Type-C jacks and connectors cost more. So you still tend to find micro USB at the bottom end of the phone world. But it's well worth it to look for Type-C, I think. I've had so many phones with micro USB get very fiddly after a few years in terms of wiggling the charging cable until the worn connectors finally make contact. And when you're fumbling around in the dark at night, then it's a huge boon to have a reversible connector. And yes, Apple did it first with Lightning, so props to it. Number 11, fast and chi wireless charging. With the eternal struggle to get to bedtime with a reasonable margin of error, both fast charging and chi wireless charging make a significant difference. Now, on the subject of fast charging, many subtle different variations are around. Always use the charger supply with your phone if you're not 100% sure which standard your phone supports. In theory, fast charging wears a phone battery out more than a standard current. A lithium ion cells like gentle charges, not savage thrusts of current, but then qi charging might wear the battery too, if only because of the heat generated, and lithium ions also hate being hot. So the jury's out. Use a standard charger most of the time, use fast or wireless if you have to, but don't lose too much sleep if you don't have these facilities in the first place. Number 10, NFC and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi 2 comms technologies. Yes, very technical, but you do need both of these. Some manufacturers, I'm naming and shaming Honor here, have omitted NFC from some mainstream mid-range smartphones. And it means quite simply that you can't use your phone to, quote, tap and pay, ever. Which is inexcusable in 2018, I'd argue. All for the sake of a dollar's worth of extra wiring inside the phone. Ditto 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. Now, this does depend to some extent on which chipset a phone runs, but if you've got 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, it'll be more future-proof, more routers are switching to 5 gigahertz, and you'll get faster wireless speeds. At number nine, card expansion. This is a polarizing feature. It really is. A little like AMOLED screens, which I'll come to shortly. You can argue it both ways. I like having a micro SD card slot. I stick in my 128 gigabyte card with all my music and a ton of video documentaries and I'm away instantly without having to wait an hour while said media copies over a cable from my Mac to a large internal flash storage disk. On the other hand, micro SD cards have been known to fail and some manufacturers fail to follow standards, insisting on reformatting inserted cards, which completely and utterly foils the point. What's more important than the presence or absence of a card slot is total storage available in a phone by either means. In 2013, happy with my Lumia 1020, this was 32 gigabyte for enthusiasts, I argued. By 2016, this was up to 64 gig for my Nexus 6P, with applications, captured videos, games and more, if not for a music library. But in 2018, Ted Salmon from PSC argues that 128 gigabytes is the new total minimum, so card plus storage or just storage. And I think he's right if you don't want to compromise too much. At number eight, stereo speakers. Yes, a pet favourite feature of mine in the Galaxy S9 Plus filming this show has proved that you don't even have to have equal fidelity from each, i.e. left and right. From the iPhone 8 range upwards, a well-tuned pair of what I call faux stereo speakers, earpiece and bottom woofer, will actually do very nicely. I'm so very glad that manufacturers are taking front-facing stereo seriously, and once you've had a phone with such an arrangement, you'll instantly see and hear why. At number seven, waterproofing. This is more than about being trendy, of course, a rating of IP67 upwards. 
is something to watch for, since it means you don't have to worry about accidental dunkings. Which of us hasn't had a phone slip into the kitchen sink or from a top pocket into a basin or toilet or even splashed the phone by mistake when swooshing the washing up? I used to freak out and we've had at least two family phones rescued from such water damage. But with a full IP67 rating or above, you can quite simply stop worrying. OK, you're not supposed to scuba dive with the smartphone, but normal life should never, ever be an issue. At number six, QHD and higher resolution. Anyone else remember when Sony made a phone with a 4K 2160p screen? It worked out to over 800 pixels per inch, which is way, way beyond what any human being can see. I guess it might be used for VR applications, but that's a bit of a niche. For everyday use, even on a 6-inch screen, I maintain that 1080p is absolutely fine. I have my S9 Plus shooting this with a 6.2-inch display set to its default of 1080p, and it hasn't occurred to me for one second since I first turned it on that it can also be set to 1440p, i.e. QHD. It hasn't occurred to me at all. Yes, I know I'm no spring chicken, and maybe youngsters can tell the difference, but for most people, most of the time, 1080p, also referred to as, quote, full HD, is absolutely fine. And QHD for the eagle-eyed, maybe, but no need to go beyond that. As with the phone show itself that you're watching, 1080p is the sweet spot on so many levels, in the phone's case, in terms of managing battery and processor drain. At number five, continuing with screens, more and more phones are coming with AMOLED these days, uh, where the pixels light up individually rather than being illuminated by a bottom of screen backlight and a reflective layer. AMOLED displays do cost more, a lot more, but they're thinner and higher contrast by definition. Plus content can move faster, so they're better suited for VR use. On the downside, apart from cost, which gets passed to you in the purchase and repair prices, there are hardware issues. Firstly, an inherent limited lifespan for AMOLED screens. The blue subpixels degrade fastest, and it's not unusual for a two-year-old much-used display to have a visible shift to yellow across the interface. I've seen it. While LCD screens last years, decades even, with no visible deterioration. Secondly, if the UI isn't done properly, you can get burn-in with AMOLED, where pixels that are always lit wear out faster. In theory, this is software fixable by minutely shifting UI elements, though. Overall, LCD, AMOLED, the jury's out. Whichever display tech your phone uses, it'll come with compromises. So accept the display, enjoy it. There's no such thing as a perfect and long-lived screen. Number four, talking of displays, two by one screens are the in thing in 2018, and it's easy to see why. Having a screen which fills the whole face of a phone has been the objective since touch-only phones started a decade ago, and now we have the screen technology and micro-miniaturization to make it happen, so why not? The only real objection is that 16x9 video content is now sometimes shown with black bars either side, but then these Areas will be black anyway on a 16 by 9 screen, surely, you know, part of the case. It's not as if you're losing anything, and if you want to fill the screen width-wise, then many services such as YouTube and Netflix do a great job of serving up 2 by one streams where possible and allowing smart cropping where not. At number three, biometrics is the next hot potato, and you need it, from getting into your banking apps with one tap to paying for things in shops. Um, from iris scanning, which is unreliable in my experience, though I do wear uh, very focals, to face recognition, which is insecure without all the high resolution data that Apple stuffs into us iPhone 10, which does work, uh, to fingerprint sensors on the front side or back. The simplest and cheapest is the latter, of course. A fingerprint sensor is only a dollar or two on the bill of materials on a smartphone nowadays, and the back is the logical placement, since you can then have the two by one screen I just mentioned without making the phone even taller. Number two, the second most controversial element in recent designs has been the so-called notch, i.e. taking the display up around the front camera and other sensors. It's ugly or distinctive if you're an Apple marketeer, but in fairness, it does give you extra display pixels for no increase in form factor. And that's a good thing, surely. The trick is, as was obvious from five seconds after Apple announced the iPhone X, in fact, it was obvious months earlier when Essential shipped its phone, its PH1, PH, well, never mind. You just run the status information beside the notch with black background, and then you don't notice the notch at all, ever. And when you play back video media or show a photo, you just have the status area black. 
It's what Huawei is doing on the latest notched P20 range, and it's why the notch really isn't a big deal. But at number one, the hot potato that has caused the most debate, the most angst, the most frustration has to be the removal by some manufacturers of the humble 3.5mm headphone jack on their flagships. Now, I know I've covered this before in individual phone reviews, but it's worth pointing out the reasons for and against the jack explicitly. Make your own mind up for the jack. Uh, number one, higher quality audio, no Bluetooth compression or recoding to get in the way. Number two, no latency issues, no dropouts. <laughs> number three, nothing to recharge to keep the tunes flowing. And number four, it's nice and simple. Pick up headphones from any shop from £5 to £500. They'll all work. At number five, you can plug in aux cables in a car or office or party. Number six, <laughs> I'm running out of fingers now, you can listen while you charge while falling asleep. Against this, there's the huge long list of pros for getting rid of the 3.5mm headphone jack. I'll go through them. Um, well, you gain a few cubic millimetres inside the phone body. That's it. The imbalance is ridiculous. And yet some manufacturers see Apple making a go of headphone jackless phones and they copy it. But Apple, A, sells a splitter where you can charge and listen at the same time. I haven't seen that in the Android world that works well at all. Uh, B, Apple ships lightning headphones in the box. And C, it's Apple. Fans will buy it, whatever it puts out. Seeing the same jack removal in the Android world is just very sad and puzzling. Your comments welcome in the channel, of course, or email them to me and I'll cover some of the responses on the Phone Show Chat weekly audio podcast.